question did we do questions on evolution from previous years yes in the last class yeah right and i told you that we will take some more questions before we go to biotechnology right okay so any any portion of evolution which is not clear to to you any of you <clears throat> Ellen and Mamuna. No, sir. No. Okay. Okay, and one more, one more feedback. So this is in general for all of you. Please attempt the complete question paper. Okay. So let me tell you one thing. Even if you are clueless about a question even if you think that you have never heard, so there'll be I, I think it's it's next to impossible that you will see a question in biology in your exam about which you will you will be completely clueless so there won't be any question like that you will be knowing something at least about it so try to write it in your own words the hesitation that whether i will write a correct answer or not makes you leave that answer completely so answer left in boards is a sure short zero you agree both of you yeah but if you have written something and if it is anywhere connected to the answer there is possibility that you will get even partial marks if not complete so it's always encouraged to attempt questions. Don't leave questions. Okay. Is it clear? Mehmana and Ellen? Yes. Yeah. Keep these things in mind. Okay. So if you don't have doubts, uh, let me quickly go to some questions that I've selected. Can you see the screen that I'm sharing with you? The questions, can you see that? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, I'll just turn off this camera because it's coming in the way. Okay, you can still hear me everyone? Am I audible? Good. Okay, so we'll go, we'll do the same thing. I will be, uh, I will ask you to read the question and then you have to send the answer in the chat. Is it okay? And if at any given point in any question you feel that you do not understand, uh, the answer then we will stop and discuss it on the whiteboard and then we'll proceed Okay, Ellen and Mamuna shall we proceed? Yes, sir. Okay, great, so Let's start with this Question four Ellen would you like to read question four? Which of the following is the correct sequence of events in the origin of life? Formation of probiotins, synthesis of organic monomers, synthesis of organic polymers, formation of DNA based genetic systems. Yeah, not directly from the books in the terms of or in the language of NCRT, but this is from NCRT, okay? Okay, your answers in the chat, please. So the options are below A, B, C, and D. Not the one, two, three, and four, okay? And please send your answer just to me.
Okay, uh, I want to just read it again. Read the question again. Helen, that's that's the correct answer. I'm going to one more try, please, by reading the question again. Because I'm sure you know this. No need to hurry. Perfect, correct Memuna. Okay, so first I'll go to Memuna. Memuna, do you understand what mistake did you commit in the hurry? Because the, the answer you chose now is the correct answer. Yes. Do, do you realize the mistake? Yes. Yes. So the formation of a DNA-based genetic system, simply in, in, in just some fancy terms, it says DNA-based genetic systems means a cell, right? A cell which has a genetic material and the cell itself is a system. So fourth option will come at the end, right? That's why A, B and C all have option four at the end because that is the most obvious thing. So you just have to understand this. Is it clear everyone? So the correct answer is option C. First, there will be synthesis of organic monomers. Monomers means just one unit of that molecule. Then these monomers will become polymers. Organic monomers will become organic polymers. Okay. In the events in the origin of life, then they will become protobionts, something which is a precursor of life. And then fourth, a fully formed cell, a system. Is it clear? Ellen and Memo. Yes, sir. Yeah, good. Good start. Question number 10. Uh, an important question. Uh, Memona, will you read that? The population will not exist in hardy in the world equilibrium if there is no migration. The population is large, and the measures may selectively. There are no limitations. Yes. Your answers in the chat. Focus on the point not. Okay, great. Right answer, Alan. Again, good. Mamuna, do you find any difficulty in this question? So please write that also, okay? Just write that um, a need discussion or difficulty. So I don't know this question. Okay, great. So let's start. The question is asking that any a population will not exist in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium if. So whenever these kind of questions comes, let me give you a quick trick. Whenever they're asking which is not correct, so you know it is behaviorally for any human, it is comparatively difficult to seek the negative answer. 
okay because we all are trained and taught and we, when we read books we read what is correct we don't read what is incorrect so it is just to trick your brain where they ask which of the following is not a correct option okay so do exactly the opposite but keep in mind that a population will exist in hardy winberg if so this means what are the assumptions made for hardy winberg equilibrium so hardy winberg equilibrium says remember i taught you a section where we discussed factors affecting hardy hardy winberg remember amana so what yes. factors affect hardy winberg migration was one factor that affects hardy winberg yes so if there will be migration it will affect hardy winberg but if there is no migration will it affect hardy winberg no so if it will not affect hardy winberg the population will exist in the equilibrium so the option says there is no migration so if there is no migration the population will not exist in a hardy winberg equilibrium this is how you should read this is a trick read the option and read the question again in the same line and it will make sense to you so you tell me is this statement correct or false there is no if there is no migration a population will exist in hardy winberg equilibrium true right because if nothing is migrating in or out the population will exist in the equilibrium nothing can take it out of equilibrium correct am i not yes so a is not the factor second if the population is large the population will exist in hardy winberg equilibrium yes again right we need to take a large population to study because if i take just five individuals a very small population there will be no equilibrium right suppose i choose five individuals of butterfly okay but there will be no equilibrium between those because their patterns might be slightly different their size might be slightly different they will they will be of different ages etc etc right so i need a large population where all these factors dilute out correct do you understand ma'am no yes so large population keeps the uh, keeps the population in equilibrium no migration keeps in it equilibrium third if individuals meet selectively the population will exist in hardy winberg equilibrium is it correct yes no that's not correct so individuals should not mate selectively there should be random mating so anyone should be allowed to mate with any other individual of the population if we we are saying in the wild that happens so in the wild populations can only achieve hardy winberg equilibrium if it is a large population if there is no migration and if individuals mate randomly and there are no mutations because if there are mutations the equilibrium will be disturbed if there is selective mating the equilibrium will be disturbed if the population size is small the equilibrium will be disturbed or there will be no equilibrium reached if there is migration then the equilibrium will be disturbed so the correct answer is c so the population will not exist in hardy winberg equilibrium if individuals mate selectively make sense yes okay we can go over it again if you don't understand okay do not let it go just because if you understand it then only we'll move forward Ellen, okay. Ellen, do you understand this perfectly? Yes, sir. Cool. Very good. So, Ellen, would you like to read question number twenty? I have occupies and I have cats show different pattern structure. Yet they perform similar function. This is an example of analogous organs that have evolved due to convergent evolution. And logus organs have evolved due to convergent evolution. Homologous organs have evolved due to convergent evolution, and homologous organs have evolved due to convergent evolution. Yes. Quick answer.
Perfect, Alan. Good. That is the correct answer. Amuna, any difficulty? Shall we discuss? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very well. So, <clears throat> yeah. First of all, the question itself gives the hint for the first part. This question is simple, but it becomes confusing because analogous organs with convergent evolution, analogous organs with divergent, homologous with convergent and homologous with divergent. All the four options are given. But remember this one thing. Eye of an octopus and eye of a cat. They are different in structure, but similar in function. So first of all, tell me what kind of organ fits in this category, which has a different structure but similar function. So remember that if the structure is same, okay, it's called homo, homogeneous mixture, similar kind of solutions are mixed, similar kind of components are mixed together, right? So homogeneous mixture, do you understand? Whenever there is similarity in the structure, okay, it is called homologous. For example, a forelimb of a human and a forelimb of a uh, tiger or a forelimb of a whale or a forelimb of a bat, any bird for that matter. Remember we did that? Mamana? Yes. Yeah. So the word homologous organs, write down in your notebook right now. Homologous organs, same, similar structure, different function. Homo. Similar. Homolog. This word homolog also comes in biology. A similar copy is called a homolog. So homologous organs, similar structure, different function. Analogous organs are different structure, but similar function, like the wings of a butterfly and the wings of a bird. Both are completely different structures, but the function is similar, which is to fly. Make sense? Amana? Yes. Yeah. So first, now you can tell me the organs that are described in this question, are they homologous or analogous? Amana? Oh, yes, sorry. 
Okay, sorry, I. Yeah. Can you see what I'm sharing? No. Yeah. Can you see the screen again? Yes, no. <laughs> Okay, just give me one second. Yeah. Can you see the screen that I'm sharing? Yes. Yeah. So tell me, Mamuna. The organs which are mentioned in question 20, are they homologous or analogous according to you? I can't hear you, Amuna. You are not audible. I think you are unmuting yourself, but your voice is not audible to me. Can you write? Yes. So write down. Uh, write your answer to me. Tell me. So these organs, eye of an octopus and eye of a cat. Different structure, similar function. Are they analogous or homologous? Perfect, they are analogous. So which means option C and D cannot be the correct option, right? Now, analogous organs means now we have to figure out whether analogous is related to convergent evolution or divergent. Okay. So analogous organs are, they give rise to convergent evolution <clears throat> because always let me tell you. So if I make four different points, one point is for the wings of the bat, one is for the wings of the butterfly. One is for the wings of a bird, let's say, okay? And let these three points. And all these three show flight as a function. So three things are coming together, right? To show a similar function. So they are converging. These three different kind of organisms are converging in their function. They are coming together and showing same kind of function, but with different kind of structures. So analogous organs has evolved due to convergent evolution. Is it clear? So write down analogous is equal to convergent. Homologous is equal to divergent. Okay. So the correct option will be option A. Is it clear to you, Amuna? Shall we move forward, Amuna? Yes, no. Okay, so, okay, so question, one more question. Question number 13. Ellen, will you read this question? The population of thousand and individuals, 360 belong to genotype AA, 480 to capital A, small a, and the remaining 160 to small a, small a. Based on the data, the frequency of allele A in the population has. 
yes alil capital a okay both are a so you have to mention capital a so based on this data the frequency of alil capital a in the population is hardy weinberg equilibrium you have the formula do it quickly i need the answer in the chat <clears throat> you have answered for question 13 memona now is this answer the option that you have selected is it for question 13 Okay, let let's allow her to join back. Yes, Ellen, your answer is correct. Perfect. So I think you don't need any explanation in this, right? Is it? It is. No, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Press two. Big Q. Press big Q, sir. Perfect. Good. Yes, ma'am. Is entering again. Mamuna, can you hear me? Can you write down your answer? Option number four, question thirteen again. Mamuna. Am I audible? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Can you write down the answer? Question thirteen again. Sure, I wrote. Okay. So is it to me? You have to send a direct message to me. I have not received. Can you send it again? Ah, question thirteen. No, that's not correct, Mamuna. So the correct answer is option C, zero point six. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You understand, or do you want a discussion on that? So Ellen has understood it. Ellen, would you like to just explain it to Mamuna the way you explained it to me? How did you figure out the answer? Yes, sir. So I use the equation p square plus two p p q plus q square equals one. So here the p p square will be the uh, capital A is capital A, two p q will be small a and capital A, and q will be a uh, small a small a. So you if you were uh, q square, huh? Yes, a q you square. You mean q square? Yes, yes a q square. So here we need to find capital A, which is p square. So p square will be three sixty. If you were, if you were to divide three sixty by thousand, come to be three point six. So a would be yes. equal to zero point six. Correct. Right. Perfect. Okay. Let me go to some little tricky questions. Now, so you can focus on being correct. Okay. Even if you take more than a minute, it's okay at this point. But I want you to be correct because we have we have discussed this part. Yes. Question number twenty-seven. Ma'am, now can you read question number twenty-seven? I don't think ma'am, I can read. Ellen, can you read? What is the most significant trend in the evolution of modern man? Homo sapiens from his ancestors. Shortening of jaws, binocular vision, increased cranial capacity, upright posture. 
Yep, your answer is in the chat. Yes, correct, Ellen. So I think you are through with this part. Yeah, so the right answer is option C, increasing cranial capacity. Uh, yes, Mamuna, if you wish. Uh, cool. So uh, in the next class, we will be, in today's class also, we'll be starting with biotechnology after a few more questions. So if you have any doubts for biotechnology, you can bring it tomorrow, okay? Okay, <clears throat> so Alan, it's you and me. Question number 29, can you read this? It is just on a fact, but we discuss this fact. Yes, so the idea of nutritious box brought forth by Hugo Dobre, who worked on evening uh, primrose, Gregor Mantle, who worked on a piece of satinum, Hardy Weinberg, who worked on the allele frequency population, and Charles Darwin, who, worked, who observed a wide variety of organisms during sea voyage. So it's option D, right? Option D, Charles Darwin. Oh, read the question again. The I, Charles Darwin gave the idea of evolution. natural selection okay. and evolution. So Charles Darwin, before Charles Darwin, it was known that there is something called mutations. That's what okay. Charles Darwin yeah, theory is based on, yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. So it's option E. Option A, correct. It was Hugo de Vries who figured out. Remember Hugo de Vries re- visited Mendel's work. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. And then he realized that, okay, Mendel's work is correct. But all his logics do not, like, oh, sorry, all his uh, ideas do not fit exactly the same on other model systems. Like evening primrose, he figured out that there is a mutation in evening primrose. Okay, so mutation was figured out by Hugo de Vries. And also linkage of genes is another question that comes. So remember some things you can write in your copy. Whenever they ask about linkage of genes, it is, who is it? Who worked on flies, remember? T.H. Morgan, Thomas Hunt Morgan. Yes, so the recombination DNA and the yes. percentages. Yes, so he said that linkage in, is inversely proportional to recombination. So linkage is Thomas Hunt Morgan. Mutation is Hugo de Vries. Mendel gave the laws of inheritance, the three laws, famous laws. Hardy Winberg gave the equilibrium. Uh, uh, what do you say? Equilibrium equation. And Hardy Winberg also explained the gene pool. So yes, gene sir. pool is conserved, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And Charles Darwin figured out two things: branching descent and natural selection. Written? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Okay, a few more questions which are. Yeah, this is done. Yeah. Question number 36. This is not a direct from NCRT, but the concept is there. Uri Miller's experiment, yes. Which, which, yes, which one of the following is incorrect about the character of probiotics? Uh, as in the in the such in the abiogenic origin of life. The yeah, theory isolated. of a biogenesis, I told you, right? Uh, that molecular evolution preceded the yes, sir. Organic evolution, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So they are partially isolated from the surroundings. They could maintain an internal environment. They could reproduce. They could separate. Uh, they could separate combinations of molecules from surroundings. So it's option D. Now look again. The question is asking which of the following is incorrect about protobionts. It's option D, right? They could separate. 
Yeah, but protobionts could separate. Remember, if they were they were not able to separate, then how is option A correct? Option A and option D are actually related, just different languages. Option A says they were partially isolated from the surroundings, right? Which means you are agreeing that protobionts were able to form something like a cell membrane. Correct? You agree? That's why you said that option A is correct. So you did not choose that it is incorrect. Option D is saying the similar thing. They could separate combinations of molecules from the surrounding. How can you separate something when you have a mem membrane inside of which you can keep something and outside of which you can throw something out? Correct? Yes, sir. So A and D both either have to be correct or have to be incorrect. So they both are correct. What do you think is incorrect about protobionts that were the precursors of life? Then is it option um, B? It's option C. Option C. Okay. Protobionts were not able to reproduce. That's why they were proto. When they became cell or systems, the first living cell, that was able to reproduce. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yeah. So 36, the right answer is option C, okay? So just write down this point in your book. Okay, so book that when it if the question that's why what they do is to make it a little difficult, they will ask you about protobionts and not about the first cell. If the question comes about the first forms of life, which of the following is incorrect about the first forms of life, then everything is correct. Nothing is incorrect. But for protobionts, they were not able to reproduce. They were only formed as a isolated systems, which later on learned to reproduce. Clear, Alan? Yes, sir. I just wanted to you to know this and note this. Yep. Done. <clears throat> Yes, uh, 47, again, a simple question, right from NCRT. Can you read 47, Helen? Which one of the following experiments suggests that simple living organisms could not have all changed spontaneously from non-living matter? Larvae could not appear in decaying organic matter. Microbes did not appear in stored meat. Microbes appear from unsterilized organic matter. Meat was spoiled when heated and kept sealed in a cell. Uh, so I said option C. Read again. What does option C say? Microbes appeared from unsterilized organic matter. If microbe appear from organic matter. Oh, yeah. yeah never mind. Yes, sir. So it is option um, B. Again, microbe so, did not appear in stored meat, but the condition of stored meat is not clear here. So if something did not appear, how will you? So read the question, which of the following experiment suggests that simplest living organisms could not have originated spontaneously from non-living matter? So what you have to, what you have to uh, prove wrong is the fact that people used to believe in earlier times that life or a living bacteria can spontaneously come from nowhere, from a non-living matter. Okay, so you keep a glass, and from that glass, some bacteria will grow. So whatever is present in that glass will get spoiled. This is what people used to believe spontaneous creation of life. But scientists prove that it's not like that. Life cannot be created spontaneously. So what experiment will nullify that is option D. When you keep a meat heated and sealed in a vessel. So if I heat the meat, I'm killing all the bacteria in the meat, right? When I'm heating it, you understand? Meat yes, was not spoiled when heated and kept sealed in a vessel. So there is a vessel which is an inorganic, non-living matter. 
there is meat inside which is organic matter but what you did you heated the meat and kept it sealed this is how we keep everything every organic matter now our milk this process is called pasteurization you heat something cook something and pack it if that packing is heated and sterilized the already present microbes will die and there is no space from where new microbes can enter so if new microbes cannot enter because it is sealed life cannot appear from non living matter so that's how it is proved do you understand why option d is correct and others are not correct yes sir yeah okay Okay, cool. So some more. Question number forty-two. Will you read again a concept-based question? Hello, forty-two. So which one? Forty-two. Forty-two. in front of your screen oh, okay okay so yes yeah. yeah, sir adapter uh, radiation refers to evolution of different species from a common ancestor uh yes sir option a you sure adapter radiation um you are correct it's option a i am very glad that you know it but you should also read other options okay oh yes okay so yeah a makes the most sense you know i yes. was i knew that you will just pick it up quickly so it's option a evolution of different species from a common ancestor migration of members of a species to different geographical area what is that called let's also talk what is b c and d um so migration of members of species or uh, to uh, it's the emigration exactly it's called emigration and genetic yes, drift or genetic shift power of so c power of adaptation in an individual to a variety of environments a um, mutation exactly perfect adaptations due to geographical isolation so that will be a industrial uh, 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 speciation speciation right yeah when you keep two things geographically isolated for a very long time they become two different species over time yeah yes sir yeah yes sir perfect very good so your concepts are very very strong for evolution and that's a very good thing uh, let, we'll take two more questions uh, two Okay, so conceptual questions, and we'll go to <clears throat> biotechnology. Okay. Yes. Question number sixty. Six zero. Which one of the following sequences was proposed by Darwin and Wallace for organic evolution? Overproduction, variation, constancy of population size, natural selection, variations, constancy of population size, overproduction, natural selection. Overproduction, constancy of population size, variations, natural selection, and variations, natural selection, overproduction, and cons constancy of population size. So it's about a sequence, okay? So that's where it becomes. So these kind of questions are not very difficult, but very confusing. So you might be knowing all the parameters, but you might not be knowing the exact sequence. So would you like to think and tell me what do you think is the correct sequence here? remember for organic evolution they are asking organic evolution means organic evolution means or evolution of life form simple don't get confused by and wallace is just another person who was independently working on the similar things that darwin was working on and he also gave independently some theories which matched with darwin's theories so, that's um, all i think it's either option a or c but i don't know is it c then so let me tell you that uh, you are correct that uh, it, it is one of the either option a or c because v b and d does not make sense because it yes, starts with variation variation okay so it should not start with variation but also you know one thing everything ends with na natural selection right yes, sir. so yes, that's, sir, that's the key nature has to select at the end something so that's why option a b and c both all three ends with natural selection So C and uh, sorry uh, B and D could not be the right. Yes, sir. Um, D clearly could not be the right option because it one, it starts with variation, which is variation. Wrong. Second, it does not ends with natural selection, which is again wrong. 
so it could either be a b or c in case of b again it starts with variation so it is wrong so the right is it has to start with overproduction and ends with natural selection right so what happens when something is overproduced for example let's let's go it and you will tell me the right answer so let's say there is a species of an insect and the insect produces 10000 kids 10 10000 new insects so when overproduction is done what should happen next <clears throat> yes that's a problem i'm not sure if it's constancy or variation uh, i think i uh, wish it's constancy exactly you are correct there. yes so the whole idea to produce more is to reach a constant level of population remember i told you that in nature to reach equilibrium which was suggested by rd winberg you need a large population size yes or no yes sir so overproduction is required to reach a constant level of population size which is big enough so that now variations can take place in that population and some will be slightly different and if those variations help in their survival those will be selected by nature so overproduction population constant variation and then natural selection is it clear yes sir so it's option c yes you were correct it was option c but do you also understand the logic now yeah yes sir okay cool so i'll take one more question which i selected is um, these are simple ones homologous organs you know yes question number 95 in the development history of mammalian heart it is observed that it passes through a two chambered fresh leg heart three chambered prop leg heart and finally four chambered stage to which hypothesis can this be cited that this site statement be approximated lamarck's principle mendelian principle biogenetic principle and hardy weinberg principle so which one explains this thing better if i say that what it is written here that in the beginning there was a two chambered heart then it became a three chambered heart and finally it became a four chambered heart that all mammals currently have so which of the following laws or principles will explain that phenomena in evolution uh, so option c biogenetic law exactly and might i know that why did not you choose the others because um, so that is the only option that is not that's... explained in ncert So this uh, the for, for option D is obviously not correct because it's the uh, it's uh, by the equilibrium per constant and B is also like Mendelian principle is about about two things you know with the uh, with two parents involved involved two parents and all yes so and option A option A is about one organism changing uh, with with the environment but it doesn't seem like environment in this one in this case so correct right so. the closest confusion could have been in option a and c so let me tell you b which is mendelian principles it talks about as you correctly pointed out it talks about generation from one generation to another what is inherited so here it is not talking about generation it is talking about developmental history okay hardy winberg law you correctly pointed it talks about gene pool doesn't talks about like um, how evolution happens <laughs> lamarck's principle talks about that when any organism uses or disuses the organ it either gains or loses here from a two chambered it is becoming four chambered but like you said no condition no environmental factor is discussed or determined biogenetic law write it down that's why i chose this question to discuss it's not explained very well in ncert but it's indirectly talked about so biogenetic law right down should i dictate are you writing yes sir yeah so write down 
biogenetic law is also known as the theory of recapitulation r e c a p i t u l a t i o n remember i showed you a picture of stage 1 embryos of all different so i was in that i was in that in the evolution chapter okay so let me so let me share that yes, yes sir with you right here so as i as i told you it is not directly explained in ncrt as biogenetic law but is talked about so uh, can you see the screen that i'm sharing alan yes sir yeah so this is a picture from which i have taken um can you see what's happening here this is a stage 1 embryo okay um yes so, so all the embryos are kind of similar no, they really exactly. similar yes all embryos look very similar but embryo 1 is of a fish embryo 8 is of a human but at stage 1 they look so similar that if i show you a stage 1 embryo you will not be able to tell that which organism's embryo it is correct yes sir now fish has a two chambered heart okay reptiles have No, kind of three, three chambered, chambered heart. Yeah. Three, and then as you go to pig, cow, rabbit, and human, they have four chambered heart. But do you see that you can figure out any difference in the embryo on the basis of that? Ah, uh, so size, like the size of the head changes, and also that like four, the size of the folds are the changes based on the two, three, and four chambers. No, but uh, about like, the heart, we don't get any information about the heart from here, right? Or that, yeah. and also the size that you're talking about of course there will be difference in size of the embryo because big organisms their embryos start a little big small organisms embryo is a little small but that is a different thing but do you see that human embryos also have gill slits near the neck where am i cursor is hovering can you see my cursor yes sir so these are gill slits a fish has gills but a human does not have gills right Yes, sir. So why do human embryos have gills or gill slits? I should say not gills, but gill slits, because this is a proof that there is a biogenetic law that works, and this is exactly how our ancestors, mammal ancestors, mammalian ancestors evolved. So if you look at the embryo of a human and a rabbit, you won't be able to find much difference, right? Gill slits are there. the eye is there the head region is there the tail is there but human embryos don't human babies don't have tail do they no, when sir. human babies are yes, born sir. they don't they are yes, not sir. born with tails but our embryos have a tail bud which stops dividing after a time and stops growing but that tail will continue to grow in a pig or a cow okay so this whole thing is known as write down law of recapitulation or called embryological parallel parallelism parallelism so if you if you study the embryos parallelly that will give you historical developmental record um, evidence of evolution so our development is similar so the development of heart in a fish which is two chambered in a salamander which is three chambered and in a pig and human which is four chambered are related okay so that's called law of biogenetic or biogenetic law or embryological parallelism is it clear yes sir okay so what you do is you go back um so you were not present during this chapter but your concepts are really uh, strong and that's a good thing but some things that you are not aware of 
so you do one thing just read the chapter from ncert okay yes, and if you find any doubt you can always bring the doubts to me in any class okay yes sir okay good so i'll stop sharing this and i will again yes can you can you see the screen that i'm sharing yes sir <laughs> okay so you understood biogenetic law yeah yes sir perfect and again just one again cause you do no yes maybe 108 read 108 Uh, better the pollen is the correct group of vestigial organs in man. Uh, nictitating mem, nictitating, nictitating, nictitating mem, membrane, ear muscles, eyelids, and cortex. Appendix, cortex, ear muscles, and elbow joint. Wisdom tooth, cortex, body hair, and ear muscles. Wisdom tooth, body hair, nictitating membrane, and vermiform appendix. Yes. So I hope you know all of these. What are these things? If you don't know, first I can explain it to you. So you know yes, what sir. is a vestigial organ? Yes, sir. I'm not sure about the nictitating membrane and the vermiform appendix. Yes, so nictitating membrane is, uh, you know that when when crocodiles they go inside the water, they don't close their eyes, but instead there is a membrane that comes out from the sides and cover their eyes like a, a water goggles. Oh, okay, right? okay, sir. So in humans also there is nictitating membrane. but that is vestigial i am telling you the answer for that so we cannot use it we only use our eyelids but uh, reptiles can and amphibians can use so that's nictitating membrane and second what were you not clear about the vermiform appendix it's appendix you know appendix yes, at sir. the end of our large it, intestine yes sir yeah it's called vermiform appendix oh, okay, full name sir. vermiform means it looks like a worm simple Now tell me the answer. What do you think? So then, is the so is the nictitating membrane the answer to be there or not there? A nictitating membrane is a vestigial organ. Okay, then it will be it will be um, option D. Option D. D. Yes, yes correct. Sir. It's option D. Wisdom tooth, body hair, nictitating membrane, and vermiform appendix. Okay. ear muscles are not vestigial they are useful so wherever there is ear muscles that is not a vestigial organ so 1 2 and 3 a b c simple all have ear muscles ear muscles are not vestigial they are useful okay is it clear yes sir by ear muscles people often think that uh um uh, since there are many organisms like rabbits correct rabbits and mere cats and all the deers they can actually move their ears have you seen a deer moving the ear like a antenna so, yes sir but humans don't do it actively correct we don't move our ears actively our ears seems to be fixed yes sir but they are not vestigial yet okay they seems vestigial but they are not Okay. Yes, sir. Perfect. Very good. So that's that's it. Now let's do one thing. Um, do you have notes for biotechnology, chapter eleven. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I do. Yeah. So open your notes for chapter eleven. I'll um let uh I will not take questions. but i am sharing that screen to you i'm giving you 5 minutes to go through to go through the notes of chapter 11 and tell me if you have any doubts that we can because we have less time so we'll take biotechnology in tomorrow's class both chapter 11 and 12 together okay 
okay sir yeah so just go through it in the meanwhile take 5 minutes on your own we might end the class 5 minutes early today we might take one or two questions if you have no doubts if you have doubts i will take your doubts so take 5 minutes go through the notes and let me know okay i'm here is that okay alan yes sir So I don't have any doubts, but can you just talk about the cloning factors part? Yes, like the, the cloning. Like, yes, I like the ORI, the active marker and cloning sites. I'm just not like exactly sure about the part. Okay. Uh, so let me see if this is the part. Cloning vector. Are you talking about uh, this um, part? I think you're talking about this part, right? Yes, that's one. Yeah, okay. So let, it starts with a question. The question is, you know what is a vector, right? Vector is a word, yes, which means anything that carries, which carries, for example, mosquito is a vector for plasmodium that causes disease. Yes, that is it carries so. that. Yeah. Similarly, plasmid, so plasmids are present in prokaryotics cell in bacteria right so plasmids are basically circular dna now we have realized that we can use that concept of a plasmid and use it as a vector to send our gene of interest into some other organisms cell and that organism is nothing else but bacteria because bacteria anyways take plasmids right so we will give them plasmids but we will put our gene of interest in that plasmid. That's why, that's how plasmid becomes a vector for us to transfer DNA from our cell into the bacterial cell and clone that gene or that DNA in the bacterial cell. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, the question is, what are the features that has to be present in every vector DNA or every plasmid? So that it is, it facilitates the process of gene cloning. Do you understand the question? Yes, sir. these three are fine, but then like the selective yeah. marker. Correct. So origin of replication is clear to you? Yes, sir. That there has to be an origin from where yes, the sir, replication sorry. will start. Otherwise, whatever we have sent will not make sense inside the bacterial cell. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are confused about selectable marker. Yes, right? sir. Yeah. Now, selectable cloning site is also clear. Cloning site is exactly the site where we cut and insert our yes, sir, the gene of interest. And, yes, sir. Great, great. Now, we come to selectable marker. Now, what is a selectable marker? Now, think it this way. Suppose I, I have inserted my gene of interest in a vector successfully. Okay. I have also successfully inserted or transferred that vector into a bacteria. But the question is, how will I know that the bacteria has taken up my gene of interest and has started transcribing and translating my gene of interest? How will I know that? So for th that is not that is not mm, possible normally, right? Suppose I have put an insulin gene in a plasmid and put that insulin gene into the bacteria. Now, bacteria will start producing insulin. Okay. Do you understand? You are with me, Ellen? Yes, sir. But in a bacterial system, insulin does not function anyways, right? It is a human protein. So, how will I know that bacteria is producing insulin? I cannot check the sugar level of bacteria, no? Do you understand? Yes, sir. So how will I know that my gene is being synthesized or not? So what we do, 
apart from our dna we also put a sequence which is called a selectable marker sequence or a gene that gene most of the time is a antibiotic resistance gene so for example in this plasmid which you can see here in red there will be a sequence that will provide the bacteria resistance against any antibiotic for example penicillin ampicillin kanamycin tetracycline all these are antibiotics okay so these antibiotics kill the bacteria correct yeah if if that gene is present the bacteria will not get killed but that gene is not normally present in the bacteria i will put that gene in the plasmid along with my gene of interest which is insulin and then put all of this in the bacteria now if the bacteria has received my plasmid it will start synthesizing insulin but along with that it will also start synthesizing the antibiotic resistance gene and now what i can do is i can make a culture plate with antibiotic in it and put these cells in that plate if these cells die which means they it has not received my plasmid correct but okay. if these yeah. cells survive it means it has received my plasmid that's why they are surviving because they got the antibiotic resistance from that antibiotic resistance gene that i have put in the plasmid and if they are showing antibiotic resistance it also means that they are also producing insulin because i have also put my insulin gene in 